Thank you, Jane. So my name's Laura, and at the moment I'm working as a consultant medical oncologist um, in lung cancer and acute oncology, so seeing quite a lot of lymphoma through that. But also I have previously worked at, uh, with the lymphoma team at the Christie doing some research into heart damage from, cancer, from lymphoma treatment. So that's where my interest in late effects from lymphoma treatment has come from. So thank you very much for letting me come and speak to you today about late effects of, of cancer therapy and particularly lymphoma treatment. <coughs> so my plan is to discuss the main late effects that clinicians worry about, so what doctors worry about, which um, I've realized working with a patient group more recently of talking about late effects with the patients. We worry about very different things potentially than patients worry about, or perhaps we worry about the same things in a different way. But I'm going to go through the main late effects that we worry about for patients when we're treating them. <coughs> and I'm going to discuss what's being done to manage this, to prevent it, and to treat the late effects of cancer therapy. We'll briefly discuss what support is available, but I know that you had a talk from Ben this morning talking about recovery package and things, but we'll touch on that as well. Um, and then if there's time at the end, if I don't go too slowly, then we'll get your perspective on late effects and what's important for you. Can you hear me okay, everybody? Yeah. Um, so the, the most important thing to say is that the reason that we are focusing on late effects and we're talking about it is because people are doing so well with lymphoma, and that's a, it's a good thing. So the focus has shifted to have much, a lot of focus on living well with, with cancer and beyond cancer. Um, and that's because we know that we're curing a lot of lymphoma patients or patients are living with lymphoma under control for many, many years. So then we've got to really worry about how uh, we give them a good quality of life and how they're affected by long-term from their cancer treatments. So I think we've had awareness about late effects from cancer therapy for many, many years, particularly in, in kids, and there's been big focus on pediatric uh, late effects in uh, children who've had cancers at a young age, but it's been slightly... Uh, slow to catch up for adults who end up living and surviving uh, cancer. So, but over the last 10 years, awareness uh, is growing about late effects, and people and the research community, the medical community, the nursing community are now engaging with this problem and how to tackle with it. And clearly, um, many of the charities are as well, and Macmillan and the Lymphoma Action Team are also you know, supporting these movements. So what are late effects? So... I th everyone has slightly different views of what a late effect is, but I think it can be anything that um, is resulting from your cancer itself or the cancer treatment, which gives lasting toxicity. And it can either start during treatment and manifest many, many years on, or perhaps you're unaware of it at the time of treatment and it's something that then uh, becomes a problem later on in life. And that can be a year or can be 20 um, and 30 years after treatment. And they can be physical problems, or psychological problems, and I really believe that the two are massively intertwined and it's very hard to separate them out. So if you've got physical uh, impairment for reasons of, of cancer treatment, then that's going to have a massive psychological impact and vice versa. <coughs> but we know from, from research that long-term cancer survivors and lymphoma survivors are, just, are generally not as well as the general public. They report more health problems, both physical and psychosocial, um, and we see more problems such as heart problems in the long term. So as clinicians treating patients uh, and treating lymphoma patients, we've really got to try and balance out our, the effectiveness of our treatment uh, with the potential long-term toxicity and side effects. Uh, so talking about the main physical effects that may cause lasting toxicity or late effects, um, we know that as well as trying to target the lymphoma itself. Unfortunately, we can't be completely targeted, and our normal tissues and our, our organs can get damaged at the same time. And not always, and not always significantly, but there is potential there. So we know that we can get neurological damage, which is damage to the brain and nerves. We can get hormonal changes and problems, which can last. We can get heart problems, which I'll talk more about. Lung problems, which... Dr. Harris has talked about with her radiotherapy. Bone problems, such as osteoporosis particularly. We know about fertility issues with chemotherapies. Bowel problems with radiotherapy, but also with chemotherapy. And potentially second cancers. So having survived your lymphoma, then there's a potential risk of other cancers as well. And I've talked a little bit about 
this already, but how do these late effects manifest? Well, some of them uh, present very acutely out of nowhere, such as having a stroke or a heart attack. Some are much, much more subtle. So uh, things like hormone changes, hormone problems, thyroid problems, can be really difficult to pick up, to identify uh, by GPs, and they aren't always linked to people's previous treatment, and many of you might have come across that already. Um, so people may present with fatigue, and that might be due to multiple reasons from their cancer treatment, um, but it takes people a, a while to realize that that's um, due to particular problems from their cancer therapy. But then that has a huge functional impact and psychological impact. And I think previously, um, even when I started training, there was a tendency to say, oh, well, it's just due to your chemotherapy, it's just due to your treatment, um, and hopefully you'll get better in time. And I think more and more we're recognizing that we need to be identifying problems that we can reverse and try and optimize people's health to help them live well. And actually, sometimes we can reverse the fatigue or the problems that are leading to, to them be, um, not firing on all cylinders and not having the quality of life that they want. So the things I'm going to concentrate on are heart health, so cardiovascular problems, uh, lungs, second cancers, uh, a bit about neurological toxicity and hormones today. So the reason I'm going to concentrate on heart health and second cancers is because although these aren't the most common side effects we necessarily see or that patients report, they're the most serious in terms of affecting people's life expectancy. Um, so this graph shows us that uh, the red line is recurrent lymphoma and the rates of recurrent lymphoma. The blue line shows the rates of second cancers, and the yellow line shows heart events, or cardiovascular events. And you can see that around 15 years after people's treatment, lymphoma treatment, the rates of lymphoma recurrence really don't go up at all, so you're essentially cured. But the rates of second malignancies and cardiovascular events, so second cancers and heart problems, suddenly starts rising year on year. So they are, this is probably the biggest um, effect on people's life expectancy um, and why perhaps patients who've had lymphoma treatments report more health problems than, than people who've not. So what is causing the heart damage and why do people get heart problems? So the two main problems are these two things here. And the first is, if you can see my pointer, the horrible red drug on the right-hand side so that is doxorubicin, or an anthracycline, which is a type of chemotherapy, which is really, really good. It's a brilliant chemotherapy. It works really, really well, and it cures lymphoma and cures many other cancers. But we know that it can affect the heart, and it can be directly toxic to the heart muscle and cause heart damage. So it can cause heart rhythm problems. It can cause heart uh, heart failure eventually, so they can stop the heart pumping so strongly. Um, so that is a big problem when it comes to heart health. And we think some damage may happen at the time, but actually it may not manifest till many years after treatment, and, and we're seeing that in pediatric, in children who've had this drug, um, and that's where a lot of the research has come from. Also, Dr. Harris showed you um, the radiotherapy that many people have, which is often because we have lymphadenopathy, lymph nodes in our chest with lymphoma, many patients get radiotherapy to the chest in some way, and there's often a dose of radiotherapy to the heart. And the radiotherapy tends to cause um, more coronary artery disease, so I think you're asking questions about whether it causes clots in vessels. But radiotherapy can cause calcification, thickening of, of uh, arteries, and that can lead to a higher risk of, of um, heart attacks and coronary artery problems. And if patients get the two together, which is obviously very common if you have a combination of chemotherapy and radiotherapy, that can then culminate together to make people's uh, heart problems worse. So this is a, a, a big problem, but we are beginning to tackle it. So we're, we've already touched on the fact that we're developing much safer radiotherapy treatments, so we're much more targeted and we're now avoiding the heart or giving a much lower dose to the heart and particularly the coronary arteries. In some of our <coughs> treatments, we're now trying to omit radiotherapy altogether if we think that chemotherapy is enough. Um, we're now beginning to look at other drugs instead of that red drug, the doxorubicin we talked about. So we're seeing if we can have 
more targeted treatments that don't have the cardiotoxic, the heart toxic effects that might be just as effective. And there's a huge amount of research going into that at the moment. We're also looking at preventative measures during treatment. So are there drugs we can give that protect the heart during treatment? And can we monitor the heart clo more closely during treatment with blood tests and see whether we can then, uh, if we're seeing problems, can we stop the treatment or switch to a different drug? And what's really, really encouraging is we're now getting specialists who um, are becoming experts in this field. So um, cardiologists are really engaging with this and they're working with oncologists and hematologists. And we now have this subspeciality of medicine called cardio-oncology. So I think that's really encouraging because it's um, driving research in the area and getting them proactively involved in managing patients who are having uh, treatment. And I think it's also about empowering um, patients and GPs to be aware of this problem so that we can modify the risk factors for the future so that if we know someone's had treatment um, that could cause some potential heart damage, if we can mitigate other risks such as smoking, blood pressure, cholesterol, exercise, weight, if we can lower the risks of other potential normal cardiovascular risk factors, we hope that will lessen the risk of, of heart problems in the future. So I think it's a lot around education, know it, being aware of this, and helping people um, to prevent problems themselves. So what about second cancers? So it's always, you know, must be hugely upsetting if you've gone, gone through lymphoma, you've got out the other side, and then unfortunately you're then diagnosed with a second cancer. But we know that chemotherapy, albeit very rarely, can cause um, uh, patients to get leukemias or liquid cancers. And we know that radiotherapy, um, many years later, usually over 10 years later, can cause solid tumours. And the ones we tend to see are related to radiotherapy to the chest, so they are lung cancers, as we've touched on earlier, and unfortunately breast cancers. And that depends on the radiotherapy field and where patients have had treatment to. But again, we're being proactive about, uh, about this and trying to prevent it or to detect it early. So we now have enhanced screening, problem, uh, screening, problems, enhanced screening programs in place for breast cancer. And patients are now getting mammograms eight years after their treatment, regardless of age, and having yearly um, screening to try and detect breast cancers at an early stage where we can treat them um, and cure patients. And there's now research around whether we can screen for lung cancers as well. And that's research in the general population, but now we're specifically looking at patients who've had radiotherapy affecting their lungs and whether we can do low-dose CT scans to look for early lung cancers. But going to the future, I hope we may be able to do blood tests to look for um, potential cancers in the blood um, and bring that into the screening uh, for patients who have been through treatment. And as I mentioned earlier, if we can try and replace chemotherapy by targeted therapy or immunotherapy, which are the new treatments coming through, we might reduce this risk of second uh, leukemias. And if we can empower patients to think about stopping smoking, that can then reduce another risk uh, in terms of um, developing second cancers, such as lung cancer. So I wanted to talk about hormones because I think this is a, a problem that is, is, is a huge problem for patients that's really under-recognized and under-diagnosed. Um, so the problem with hormone uh, effects from cancer therapy is that it's often, they often present very subtly and they're very hard to detect unless you're thinking about it. So patients may report, um, and you may relate to this, that they just have uh, less energy, they're gaining weight, they've got mood swings. Some might um, have uh, sweats and hot flushes and lower libido, and that may be related to ovarian failure or low testosterone levels. They may have erectile dysfunction, and people often don't report that. Um, but also we see a high amount of osteoporosis and patients getting fractures many years after therapy. And I think that's a very under-recognized problem in, in lymphoma patients and any patients who've had cancer therapy. And the big driver behind that is, is partly chemotherapy, sometimes radiotherapy to affect bones or certain areas of the body. But a lot of it is to do with steroids, I think. So we know as lymphoma patients... We get a lot of steroids throughout our treatment. Steroids are a huge part of our uh, very effective uh, lymphoma treatment. But they have huge effects on our hormonal balance system. And those effects are, uh, can happen very acutely, but they can have some long-term effects. 
like lowering, lowering bone density and causing osteoporosis and suppressing our own steroid um, producing ability. So what is being done about this? So I think awareness about this is, is risen hugely over the past few years and we're now much better at monitoring for this, so looking at people's hormone levels, looking at thyroid function, uh, looking at people's bone um, health with the view of detecting problems and reversing them if we can, so treating them. And as a result, we have much closer working with endocrine teams. So endocrine, our endocrinologists or endocrine teams are hormone specialists that help us treat problems such as thyroid problems, diabetes, um, and bone health. So we're being much more proactive about treating them. And I think the one big thing that we are attempting to do and may not have got there yet is to have better communication with GPs about these risks so that they're um, able to detect them in the community and be looking out for these potential problems. And as part of that, what's really important is that we have good, detailed, and uh, informative treatment summaries that go with both the patients and uh, the GPs, but also can be taken into, uh, in with patients if they get admitted to hospital in the future, so that they know exactly what treatments people have had and exactly what problems might be expected. Okay, so I'll talk briefly about brain and nerves. So I think this is quite an uh, under-researched area, but there's lots of research beginning to happen in this area. So um, we know that chemo, chemo brain or chemotherapy brain is definitely a thing. Lots of patients report problems such as poor concentration, sleepiness, memory problems um, during uh, chemotherapy. And the majority of the time, we hope that that will improve, but occasionally it doesn't. And I think up to 75% of people, so three quarters of patients, might say they still have some sort of problems with memory or difficulty with recall, or just not quite as fast with their thinking as they were before. And a lot of that may be due to chemotherapy. So as uh, often the high dose methotrexate, if people have ever had that, uh, vinblastine can affect nerves, but steroids also play a part in this as well, we think. And obviously, if anyone's ever had radiotherapy to the brain, that can, then that can cause some lasting damage, which adds to this uh, the ongoing problems of memory. But we can also get peripheral nerve damage, so damage to our nerves in our hands and feet and other bits of the body. So some people might complain of lack of sensation in their hands and feet, which may then affect their uh, ability to walk and move and function. Um, and that's something we can monitor through treatment, but is very difficult to reverse. Um, so we need to be really trying to look at it during treatment and try and prevent it happening. So what's being done about that? Well, there, as I say, there we are beginning to, to drive research in this area, um, and we've now got the ability to do some functional brain I imaging, and there is some research showing that uh, with certain types of scan, when you look at the brain function and look at glucose uptake, that that reduces when you finish chemotherapy. So the brain isn't as active as it was soon after chemotherapy. And hopefully that does get better. But um, I think we therefore are thinking about the need to de-escalate treatments. So avoiding chemotherapy if we need to, reducing doses if we can, um, or trying to mitigate the problems as we go along. So whether we can do brain training during treatment, think about acupuncture and whether that helps. But I think what's really interesting is that I'm not sure this is totally treatment related because there's a bit of research out there to say that people's brain function goes down um, before they even have chemotherapy and that might be related to the cancer itself, the stress of the situation or maybe multifactorial. So uh, lastly, and I think lastly or nearly lastly, I'm to talk about the lungs. So uh, Dr. Harris has already talked a little bit about lungs um, and why we might get some lung damage. And there are two main reasons from lymphoma treatment that the lungs can uh, have long-term toxicity. And one of those we've talked about already is the radiotherapy. So if the radiotherapy goes, is to, towards the chest, then the lungs can get the dose of radiation, get inflamed, and subsequently can cause fibrosis, which is essentially scarring of the lungs. And, but there's also a drug that we use a lot, which is, again is very effective, and that's bleomycin, and that can cause some, a long-term um, inflammation and then long-term scarring. That's very rare, but it's possible. So we are now um, beginning to think about how we might omit this from treatment, and there has been a trial uh, suggesting that it's safe to do so in patients that have a good response to treatment 
um, after a PET scan, after the initial uh, few courses of chemotherapy. So we know that radiotherapy treatment is improving. We're beginning to look at better drugs that have lower toxicity, and we may be able to do away with those cardiotoxic and lung toxic drugs that we've talked about. Um, so we touched on fatigue at the beginning, and I think having worked, as I said, worked with patients <coughs> recently, I think fatigue is clearly a huge, huge problem for patients. And I think there isn't one thing necessarily that's driving the fatigue. And it may be a combination of all <coughs> those things I've talked about. And patients may not have um, significant heart problems or significant lung problems or significant hormone problems. But if there's just suboptimal um, function because of having cancer treatment before, perhaps that's enough to just <coughs> affect people and cause fatigue and problems in the long run. So I think, again, it's about making sure we are detecting any reversible problems and that we're putting them right if we can. And then that we're working with patients to, to learn about how we can manage fatigue um, and how we can learn to cope with it and improve patients' uh, life after cancer therapy. So that may be about optimizing their general health, and as we've talked about already, mitigating other risk factors. That may be looking at exercising. That may be looking at a lot more, a lot more support for patients, which has previously perhaps been lacking when people have finished uh, their therapy. So that brings me on to the psychological aspects of, of uh, lymphoma treatment and the long-term <coughs> impact uh, that we have on our psychology. So we know a lot about the acute setting, I guess, and I think we of now I hope people get a lot of support when they're going through treatment and at the time of diagnosis. But I think there comes a difficult, really difficult time at the end of treatment where they complete treatment and, or at the end of being monitored and being discharged finally from their um, oncologist or hematologist. And that is maybe where uh, the time where more support is needed because people feel very left out there on their own. And all those feelings come back again. So that feeling of grief of the life they had before, the uh, lack of control, um, the, the, fact, the, the effects that their treatment has had on their activities, their work, their self-identity and their relationships. So we need, I know that when Ben talked earlier, he hopefully talked about um, the elements of the recovery package and how that we need to be taking all these things into account going forward. Um, but this is something that, patient, pe that people and clinicians are now much more aware of. So it's not just about the physical issues, it's about um, bringing together the psychological impact and the physical impact and working together to see how we can move forward and improve things for patients. So what about monitoring and follow-up? So we obviously think it's important that as patients you need access to the experts and you need help when it's needed. But also, it may not be uh, the best thing or it could be detrimental to be brought back for follow-up for life to see your oncology expert or your hematologist because there's a lot of anxiety for coming toward those appointments. And often, the focus is very much on the lymphoma and looking at recurrence and relapse, and that is the worry for both the patient and the clinician. But as time moves on, actually, we need to be shifting towards uh, looking at other things like the late effects that we've talked about, and the focus needs to be about how to live well and healthily for longer. So at the Christie, we now have, have a program called the ADAPT program, looking at an open follow-up, um, where we give detailed treatment summaries to the patient and the GP, um, detailing the potential late effects, so that can empower the patients and the GPs to monitor themselves and to optimize their health. And as I talked about earlier, we now have subspecialists, not just in, in cardio-oncology, so in heart health, but we now have subspecialists who are interested in the late effects of cancer therapy in different areas. So we have GI specialists, so bowel specialists. We have bone health specialists, endocrinologists who are really looking into looking after patients who have developed problems as a result of their cancer treatment. Um, and the implementation of the holistic needs assessment and the recovery package, I hope, will help to support and improve life for patients after cancer therapy and lymphoma treatment. So that will not only pick up physical problems that are, uh, have been ongoing problems or are new problems for patients, but also pick up the psychological side of things, the social side of things, the financial side of things, and uh, signpost to them to the, to, to the correct support services. So I know that some of you may be aware that the Lymphoma Action Group 
has a, a course about life beyond lymphoma. It's called Live Your Life. And the Macmillan do a similar thing called Hope. And there are lots of local initiatives going on now about how to optimize health post-cancer treatment. But we've got to remember that the reason we're now focusing on the problems of late effects and living well with, uh, with and beyond cancer is because we've got a, a huge population of lymphoma survivors now or patients who are living with their lymphoma control for many years. So it's a good thing that we're beginning to focus on all these potentially upsetting late effects, but it's a, a positive step. But I think going forward, we've got to work more on prevention and continue to work to find safer and less toxic treatments to minimize our steroid use, because I feel they have a, a big problem to play in late effects, to look at protective strategies during treatment, but also uh, post-treatment, so trying to prevent second hits um, and by, uh, by um, reviewing lifestyle measures and mitigating other risk factors. And I think a bit like surgeons do when they have a, a, a formal rehab program, perhaps after cancer therapy and lymphoma therapy, we need a similar thing where we have a rehabilitation uh, that talks about all of those things. And I think that's coming with the recovery package, but I think we also need to medicalize that a little bit and look at heart health and lung health and, um, and hormone health and do it more formally. So I think, I don't know how much longer I've got. <coughs> okay. So I was just going to finish by, uh, obviously, want to take some questions, but also get your thoughts about late effects um, and be interested to know whether you think all the problems that I've talked about, about heart health and lung health, whether those are problems that you are thinking about or whether perhaps you've got completely different worries about late effects from cancer therapy. So thank you very much for listening. I'll be happy to take any questions.